Thanks, Anna. Thanks everyone for coming. Today uh, we're going to talk about protein sequence generation with evolutionary diffusion. So the general motivation here is that we want to come up with new proteins that do new functions. And some examples of what people have done in the past uh, when people want to expand the scope of functional space occupied proteins, uh, we people have done new chemistry. For example, the Arnold lab used engineered cytochrome C, which is, I don't think naturally is an enzyme, to catalyze carbon, the formation of carbon silicon bonds, which don't occur in natural biology, but they are were known in organic chemistry. Um, asparaginase, for example, is an enzyme that breaks down the amino acid asparagine. So asparaginase is used as a chemotherapy drugs for certain leukemias that where the cancer cells can't synthesize their own asparagine. So breaking it down in the environment kills the cancer cells faster than it kills the healthy cells. And then we have molecular tools such as GFP, green fluorescent protein, uh, which we can use to visualize things in cells. Other, the other really interesting family of tools here include uh, things like channeladopsins and other opsins for um, optogen optogenetics. And the overarching philosophy is we want to generate new proteins to expand functional space. And we're gonna do this by learning from the space of sequences or structures present in biology to build generative models that produce new proteins that will hopefully achieve things like uh, therapeutics, uh, things that are useful for sustainability and beyond. And recently there's been a lot of interest in using a family of models called diffusion models. Uh, they started out being used for images uh, for computer vision. And people like them because they generate high quality images and they don't suffer from a problem called mode collapse, meaning that uh, previous kinds of deep learning models, often you would train them on many images and then when you generate, there would just be certain classes of images that almost never showed up in their generations. Whereas these diffusion models cover all parts of the distribution of the training distribution much better. And so the early work in applying diffusion models here use diffusion models to generate protein structures. And the way this works is in a diffusion model, you have a four process of corruption and then a backwards process where you can think of it as reconstruction or generating from noise. So to generate structures, you start with real structures and then you corrupt them by adding random noise to get random structures. And so here uh, we're showing an angle representation in the top here, this kind of green one, and then the 3D structure below that. So X0 is your training, is your training data point. Xt is a corrupted training data point at the maximum time step which is indistinguishable from a sample from random noise. Then during training, you train a neural network to take in uh, X little t, which is corrupted, and predict the previous time step, X t minus one. And so, so you do this for many Xs and many time steps, and training time, and then generation time, you can start from random structures and denoise them step by step to come up with realistic looking uh, structures. And so uh, we have some previous work in our group started by an intern named Kevin Wu. Uh, this is a preprint, it's uh, under review now. But the idea here was we used an angle parameterization of the, of the backbone structure. And so we just, we use a simple transformer model to generate uh, these, backbone angles from random angles. And this works pretty well, and there's other models that have improved on this. Uh, the most, the best known one now is called RF Diffusion in the Baker lab. And they generate really realistic structures, and they can also generate novel structures that don't look like things we see in nature, but are synthesizable in the lab. However, we would like to operate directly in sequence space because sequence uh, is a universal protein design space. So by operating in sequence space, we can eliminate the need for sequence design. What I mean by that is if you generate a structure 
what you actually synthesize in the lab is an amino acid sequence. So you have to have a different model or some other biophysical method to uh, design a sequence that will fold to that structure. There's many function predictors out there that go directly from sequence to function. And that's because um, the, the amino acid sequence completely completely defines the protein structure and function. And we would like to use these function predictors to condition our generations in the future. There's also just many more sequence, sequences and structures. If we look at, say, UNIREF 50, which is um, a deduplicated set of high fairly high quality sequences, there's about 15 million sequences there versus 200,000 experimental structures in the BDB. And there's also ranges of regions of protein space that are inaccessible to these structure-based methods, such as uh, IDRs, uh, intrinsically disordered regions, which are important for a lot of cellular functions. So put all that together, we know that in protein, uh, in protein design, the sequence determines the structure, which determines the function. And we would like to go work directly in sequence space to get you function. And this is this paper is going to be joint work between a fairly large group of people at MSR. I was led by Sarah Landari, who's that first person on the left, uh, and with major contributions also from Nithya Thakar, who was a intern at MSR. And then also we also work closely with other researchers such as Alex Liu, Nicola Fuzzi, Mary Mandenberg, and Abed. And this is now available as a preprint. I think there's a link on the last slide. So we call our model EvoDiff for evolutionary scale diffusion. And so here on top, we see that same kind of overall controlled corruption diff diffusion framework, where there's a four process that turns real examples into noise. And then you learn a denoiser that can start from noise or random sequence, random uh, sequences or a random picture or a random structure and step-by-step -step denoise it into something that looks real. So we want to do this in sequence space, which is discrete, unlike uh, the angle space we worked with earlier or how we usually think about images. So here, X0 is going to be some amino acid sequence. And we're going to consider a few different ways to correct the sequence. One is called order agnostic diffusion, OADM, the order agnostic diffusion model. And here, at every time step, we randomly choose one amino acid and convert it to a mass token. And at the end, we have a sequence of all masses. And to go the other way, so during training, you show the model partially masked sequences and train it to predict the original unmasked amino acids. You, you show this for many com many combinations of mass and unmass tokens so that it learns to do this for any set of ma mass and unmass, which is to say you can do this for any time step of the diffusion process. Uh, and at generation time, you start from all mass and you choose one position to unmask at every time step based on your model's um, prediction for what should go there. Now, this is based on the model that was first published by a group out of Google at ICR 2022. The other framework we use uh, is called D3PM, which stands for Discrete Denoise and Diffusion Probabilistic Models, which is pretty long. Originally published at NURPS, also by a group from Google in 2021. And in this process, instead of always changing things one at a time to a mass token, at every time step, Every residue has some probability of mutating or transitioning to a different residue. And you can explore what kind of transition matrix you want. You can use a uniform matrix where everything has an equal probability of going anywhere else. Use something based on evolution, like a blossom derived matrix. And after you do many, many time steps, um, the, the sequence is indistinguishable from a sample from uh, over uniform distribution of amino acids. And the neural net 
is trained to undo these mutations. And this is a pretty challenging task because the neural network doesn't know which positions were mutated. Unlike the first scheme, the OADM scheme, where the presence of the mask tells the model this position has been corrupted. And so the example here, we start from the same sequence. Uh, you sample a time step. Based on the time step, you sample a mutated sequence. And then the model tries to predict the previous time step, the unmuted, unmutated sequence. All right, so it turns out that that first scheme does work a little bit better. And so we're going to call that model evil diff seek. And the reason, once again, the reason we call it evil diff is because because of the scale of the training. And we, when we say we train an evolutionary scale sequence space, we mean that um, we train on sequences derived from many organisms that do many functions. Uh, in this case, we use sequences from unit 50 and we train a 640 million parameter CNN. We do try different model sizes and we show in our preprint that this corruption scheme is the only one of the two that scales, that improves as the model size gets bigger, which is one of the reasons we pick it. And you could conceivably think of making the model even bigger. And to show an example of what this looks like at generation time, you start from all masks and you, at every time step, run the, se the corrupted sequence through the model, pick a location on a mask and decode it based on the model's predictions. And so here, uh, the sequence is a real example of generating from you with seek. The structure, we just ran the partial sequences through a megafold and made an animation. So that's mostly just for visual effect, except for the last one, which is the actual megafold prediction for the full generated sequence. And an interesting note about evil seek, which is remember that order agnostic diffusion model is that it generalizes two previously commonly used language models, the, the mass language model scheme and the autoregressive language model scheme. So in the left to right autoregressive language model, you start from a start token and you always look at the previous tokens to decide what to generate next. So this constrains you to one decoding order. The benefit is your model has to learn that stop because it only has to learn to generate left to right. So instead of having to learn every order, every possible generation order. The downside is uh, you can't do, and I'll, we'll show some examples of this later, as easily it's kind of conditional generation where you fix certain parts of your sequence, mass the parts you want to regenerate, and generate around the parts you want to hold fixed. And that's because the model is only trying to go left to right in one order. Another common family of protein language models are called mass language models based on the BERT mass language model in NLP, natural language processing. And here, there's generally a fixed percent of the sequence that gets the master corrupted at every, uh, during training. And the model is trained to reconstruct the original sequence. And this is equivalent to only learning one step in the diffusion process. And the people have used these as part of uh, structure prediction pipelines because um, you can kind of think of these mass language models trained on evolutionary data as amortizing MSA search so that the representations they learn are very similar to what you would get if you took a single sequence into the homology search and built an MSA. So models like Omega Fold and ESM Fold First, do this step of pre-training. Uh, other people have tried to use these models as pre-training tasks for um, other types of prediction tasks, such as fitness uh, function prediction, signal peptide prediction, uh, stability prediction, those kinds of things. And sometimes they work really well, and sometimes they work a little bit well. And there's also been a little bit of work trying to use what's called Gibbs sampling to generate new sequences using the mass language model which is kind of a hacky, hacky thing to do where you, hack, you start with any starting sequence 
you randomly choose some part of the mask and regenerate those positions. And you can repeat that until you're satisfied with the amount of diversity you have. Unfortunately, because these aren't trained to generate from scratch, if you try to use them to generate, they know what sequences from scratch. They don't do as well as a model that's been trained explicitly to do that. So what I'm showing here is as you mask more of the sequence, how well can you reconstruct the mask positions? And remember that the CARP is a mask language model. It's the same architecture, same training set as the Windows Seek. At these low mask percentages, it's trained on about 15% masking. So it has lower perplexity, which means it makes better predictions than you would have seek. But the prediction quality just, just blows up. It gets really bad as you mask more of the sequence because it hasn't been trained to do that. Whereas even with the seek, because it's trained to generate from scratch, uh, gives you much more reasonable predictions, even when almost the whole sequence is masked. And so CARP is by us, which is why we have the architecture and the same training set. Uh, ESM is a family of very popular transformer mass language models out of meta AI, which unfortunately laid off the whole team. All right, so next we're gonna show that evil diff enables a controllable generation of proteins that are both plausible and diverse. And so quick reminder, uh, the main claim here is that by training on sequences from across evolution for many organisms, for many functions, and many tens of millions of them, using this or agnostic diffusion framework, we're gonna show we can generate sequences that are plausible or high quality, are diverse from each other, and that cover the training distribution or the distribution of natural proteins. And we wanna show that we can do some conditional generation at the end as well. So start with possibility. So to evaluate this, uh, one simple thing we can do is see how they look when we predict their structures. So the pipeline here is we start with EWDF or some other algorithm, we can generate sequences, and you can run them through a structure prediction pipeline or a model such as a make fold. You have a predicted structure and you can look at the output of PLDT, which is the prediction confidence by residue or by uh, for the whole protein. We can also then take that predicted structure and use a different model to predict the sequence or to refold the sequence and compare that predicted sequence to the generated sequence. We call that a self-consistency perplexity. So higher PLDT is good, lower perplexity is good. And so first we ran a bunch of test sequences through. These are sequ natural sequences that were not in our training set. And you can see there's a pretty wide range of, for both perplexity and uh, PLDT amongst natural proteins. But there is a slight concentration in that high confidence, low perplexity region at the lower left. And here we run a thousand generations from evil diff through. You can see that while we are not quite as concentrated in that lower left-hand corner, we do get a good of still a fair number of generations there. And in fact, if you then go cherry pick things, it's definitely possible at across uh, many sequence lengths to find proteins that are high confidence, low perplexity, and have a low similarity to the closest natural sequence. So these all have PLDTs above 75, perplexities below eight, and except for the middle one, sequence similarity under 30%. I'm not sure why we picked this one. That's almost identical to a natural one. Uh, these are cherry picked from this, this region here, but generating is pretty cheap. So you can always generate more things. And we, we, we would argue that the quality of the generations we get is a result of using a model that's explicitly trained for generation. So here's that previous slide, a previous plot from you would have seek. If we use a left to right language model, the same architecture and the same training set, you actually get slightly better possibility, structure possibility measures. And both of these are explicitly trained to generate things uh, from scratch. 
However, if you use a protein mass language model, such as CARP, or in this case, ESM2, which is the most recent one, uh, you see that because even though this is a bigger model and trained on a, a very similar data set, because there is a mismatch between the training task and the generation task, the quality of the generations is not as good. All right, next we're gonna show that in addition to having individually high quality generations, we also can cover the uh, set of natural proteins. So the way we show that even if seek and recapitulate the natural function distribution is we take a bunch of sequences, first test sequences, we run them through another protein uh, language model called PROT5 to get embeddings. Uh, the reason we choose PROT5 it's because there's been other work showing that you can use its embeddings to infer Go annotations from sequence. Uh, and then you can plot those with UMAP and see what they look like. And then you can take a model and generate sequences and also run those through PROT5 and look at those. And ideally you'll want those distributions to match pretty well. So here we can see that on the right side, we're looking pretty good. There's this region on the left where we're looking kind of sparse. We can also quantify this with with, with a Frechet, Frechet distance. Uh, with FPD stands for Frechet protein distance, so lower is better. And that just looks at how likely those embeddings were to have come from the same distribution. So we can do this for you of seek. We get some number. It's hard to interpret that number unless we look at some other, other models. So once again, we see that the left to right language model does very well. Uh, mostly it improves on covering this region on the left. Uh, we're kind of curious what's in this region that seems to be hard to generate. Let's, we're trying to pick some sequences there and see what they are. But remember, the reason we want to use this diffusion framework later is for conditional generation. So even though for unconditional generations, the, the left to right autoregressive model seems to do really well, it, it's not as flexible for some of the downstream applications. If we take a protein mass language model, once again, there's that mismatch between the train and the generation tasks. And we see that uh, we do a much poor job both qualitatively and quantitatively of covering the natural distribution. And if we use structure-based diffusion, in this case RF diffusion, because uh, you're training on a much smaller set of sequences or a much smaller set of proteins, and a, bi a set that's not representative of natural protein space, you also don't cover the natural distribution as well. We can also look at uh, the distribution of predicted secondary structures. So once again, we start with um, we start with any set of generated sequences, run them through a secondary structure predictor based on protrans, which predicts helix, strain, or loop for every position. And then we just take the marginal distribution over the entire generated set. So for the validation set, uh, this is what it looks like, the distribution of helix and strands. So loop is just uh, one minus strand plus helix. And we can also compare that distribution to the distribution for the test sequences. And so comparing validation and tests kind of gives us a lower bound for how good, how close we can expect those distributions to be. So those are just random sets of natural sequences. And so the KL divergence there is about 1.4 times 10 to negative fifth. Take would of seek, uh, we get approximately one order of magnitude higher, but qual qualitatively, the distribution doesn't look terrible. We can see once again that the left to right autoregressive model does very well here. Uh, ESM2, the mass language model, does much poor. Um, it kind of fails to generate things that have strands or helices. And RF diffusion that has the opposite problem where it really generates really structured events, which makes sense because it's trained on PDB structures. All right, so here we've shown that using evolutionary scale sequence data and diffusion allows us to 
generate things that are both plausible in the sense that individual generations are high quality and diverse, both from each other, and in the sense that they cover the natural distribution. So next, we're going to look at a few examples of conditional generation. So the first thing we're going to do is actually introduce a new model called EvilDiff MSA, which is very similar to EvilDiffSeq, except now instead of training to generate individual sequences, we're going to train an entire MSA. So a quick review here to build these MSAs. Uh, what people do is you take your original sequence, we call it query sequence, and you do a homology search in a database, find a bunch of related sequences. And we use OpenFold, which is built for structure prediction. But we're going to subsample these at every run of 64 sequences just for computational efficiency. And we're going to run these through the same uh, OADM framework, where I and we just treat every position in every row equally. So at every step, you pick one amino acid from the MSA to mask until at the end, everything is masked. And then you train your network to predict uh, the identities of the masked residues. Once again, we do this across many organisms and many functions. Uh, we use 100,000 MSAs from OpenFold. Uh, there, one caveat here is that this is a slightly a more biased training set because those were chosen for um, structure prediction. So structure proteins are gonna be very overrepresented over there. And we're gonna use evil diff MSA first as an amortized local generative model. And what I mean by that is for a while now, people have trained these local general models where you take a natural protein family, which you usually get by taking a query sequence and your homology search, and you run it through some kind of model, which doesn't have to be a neural net necessarily. People, the simplest thing you can do is just sample from the frequencies at each column with that independently. And hopefully you get new functional proteins that are diverse from each other and from the natural protein family and maybe give you some new functions or just give you a better starting point for engineering. And so when I say even if I'm say is an amortized local generative model, what I mean is we can do evolution guided generation by taking that natural protein family, masking out the query and regenerating. And it's amortized because we have already trained 100,000 MSA, so we don't have to train a new model for every family. And once again, we're gonna use this kind of structure prediction pipeline to validate these in silico. So we take our original MSA, we amass up the query, run it through evil diff MSA to regenerate the query sequence, run that through structure prediction, in this case, omega fold, uh, and the same inverse folding pipeline to get the perplexity. And so here we can see for the validation set, uh, these are pretty structured, so they tend to be lower perplexity and higher confidence than the you know, 50 sequences. And you see the regenerated ones, we don't quite get into that lower left right hand corner as well, but not bad. And so the bar plot, bar plots just show the same data. So the gray is the validation set for sequence PLDT, which is higher is better, and for perplexity where lower is better. And then we show the distribution for you with MSA. Uh, we also try generating from ESM MSA, which is the same 100 million parameter MSA transformer architecture, but train on 100 million uh, MSAs from the F100, which would have loved to train on, but ES, uh, Facebook never open sourced that data set, data set. And it's pretty expensive to generate. Uh, the difference, the other difference there is that this is a mass language model instead of a diffusion model. And so you can see that having that explicit generative pre-training task does give you higher confidence queries and lower perplexity queries. We also try a non-neural net model, a, a POTS model. If we've used CCM pred, CCM gen, yeah, there's a citation for it, um, which is a pairwise energetic model that learns uh, the likelihood of the single amino acid frequencies that position, as well as a limited a regularized set of the pairwise energies. And then you can use that to generate from new sequences from the alignment. 
And you can see that this model does pretty well also on um, possibility, structural possibility. So this same plots again. Now we look at the bottom of this plot where we can also take the original query sequence, uh, run it through a mega fold and evaluate the TM score, or we could, I guess we could have done RMNC as well, which in the generated and original query structures. And so here we see it for uh, Evo Def MSA. You want to be more similar to the original query. And the lines are just at 50% to show where it is. And we get a pretty wide range depending on the MSA. So ESM MSA, once again, does much worse here. There's many more um, lower TM scores. And the POTS model, even though if you just look at the original sequence, the original structure, the predicted generated structure, they look pretty good. They're pretty different from the original structure. And we can also evaluate the sequence similarity between the generated query and the original query. And here you want to be different because it's born and just generate the same thing. And we see that, uh, and in addition to looking at the generic query, you also have to look at the original MSA. And so here you want to be less similar on the sequence side. And you see that you uh, have MSA and yes, MSA both generate pretty diverse things. Whereas the POS model is actually much more conservative. Um, even though it generates, you could argue, novel structures or bad structures or diff just different structures, which is interesting. And here are some cherry picked examples of generated queries and the original query structures. So all of these are, have uh, TM scores above 0.6 and high, high structure prediction confidence at pretty low sequence similarities, like 25% is the highest one. Some of them are less than 1%. All right, next, uh, we're going to try to generate disordered regions. So intrinsically disordered regions perform accelerator functions. Here's a pretty animation again. And if you look at uh, those secondary structure predictions from earlier, we see that you would have seek uh, produces many strands and many helices and many things that don't have, some things that don't have much strand or helix. Whereas something like RF diffusion, which is trained to generate structures, not surprisingly, does not generate things down this lower left-hand corner. So the hypothesis here is, could we actually try to generate disorder regions on purpose? And the way we're gonna do that is we're gonna find real IDRs, mask them out, and regenerate just the disordered region. Uh, you can do this with seek, or if you take um, evil diff MSA, you you can do some bioinformatics and align the structured regions, and then hope that the IDRs in between them are also aligned if the structured regions are aligned. Mask out the query and just once again regenerate the disordered region. So then you take that generated, regenerated protein, run it through a disorder prediction algorithm and see if it matches the predictions for the original query sequence. So this, this disorder prediction thing give, method gives you a disorder score at every position, at every resting. And ideally you wanna see these predictions match while having a fair amount of sequence diversity. So we look at, here is a, an example of with the seek where we generate a IDR region with only 17.7% .7 similarity. Uh, in this case, very high predicted disorder in, in the IDR and preserving structure outside of it. Here we show the same thing for you of diff MSA. So the MSA ones tend to be more conservative, which makes sense because we're given a lot of um, a lot more information. And here we show that uh, we can preserve the predicted disorder while 
within that region without messing up the structure around. Those are cherry picked examples. Here are the entire distributions for both UODF seq and UODF MSA. So here we're showing for the disorder regions and the surrounding structured regions to predicted disorder score for the true sequences, the generated sequences, and as a baseline, the random sequences. And you can see that even if in both cases is doing better than the really simple baseline of just randomizing the IPR region. And as I hinted at earlier, if we look at the similarity to the original IPR sequence, uh, so to the left is less similar, you would have seek gives you much more novel IDRs than you would have MSA, which could be good or bad depending on what you want. And there's a citation to the disorder predictor we use, Dr. Burt. Enjoy you see. All right, so for the last chunk here, I'm going to talk about motif scaffolding. And the motivation here is that there's a variety of protein functions that you can think about as being mediated by a structural motif that's stabilized by a scaffold. And things like this include epitope presentation, or these viral receptor traps, uh, some enzyme active sites, and the protein protein interactions. And um, the idea here is that that purple region is what actually does the function you care about. And the gray scaffold holds those purple residues in place in 3D space so that they can perform the desired function. Uh, I saw this figure from a science paper from the Baker Lab. And so one thing people have done, have been really interested in doing with structure-based diffusion models is holding a, specifying a motif in 3D space and then generating a backbone structure around it and then filling in those sidechain atoms in the backbone, seeing if it works. And with our things like RF diffusion, that actually works pretty well. We, we were curious, can we do this entirely in sequence space, given the motif residues? And of course, for asking this question, the answer is going to be yes. And so what we do is if you take enough, you can take a natural protein with uh, that motif that you want in green, we can mask out the rest of it and then regenerate the rest. And then predict the structure once it's done generating. And you can see that the original motif and the final scaffold for the motif align pretty well. And we do this without using structure information and generation time. All right, so that's one example. Here is that uh, same example. Again, you can see uh, where in the sequence um, the, the motif is in the original sequence and in the regenerated sequence. Uh, we're showing the PLDT. So alpha omega fold is pretty confident. That's the structure it will take. Uh, the motif RMSD, we want that as low as possible. And then the overall TM score between the two structures. Uh, so here's one from Evo to MSA. And you notice that we can do disjoint uh, motifs, disjoint functional motifs. And here we have a very low motif RMSD, uh, despite radically changing the length of the scaffold. And so if we consider uh, the scaffolds to be successful, if the motif RMSD is less than one, uh, one angstrom, and we can compare you would have MSA, you would have six RF diffusion. So overall, uh, out of, I believe, a thousand generations, um, RF diffusion, we can see the success rates overall. And then for a problem is solved, the last column, if there's at least one successful scaffold. And we took 17 problems from the RF diffusion paper and tried them. You see that we get pretty competitive results without having to explicitly use structure information. Uh, zooming in this a little bit, we see that in general, you would MSA is gonna give you more successes than you would have seek, which makes sense because the MSA implicitly gives you structure information. 
uh, with the exception of one PRW, which is weird. Um, so here on this plot, every point is a problem. What, and the label is it's the PDB for the original wild type protein. And this is the number of successes out of 100. So MSA is usually more successful. If we consider EO diff MSA versus RF diffusion, you saw in the previous slide, they each successfully solved 13 out of the 17 problems, but there's almost no correlation between how well they do on each of the problems they solve. So they seem to have orthogonal spreads, which we found pretty interesting, with the exception of uh, 1BCF and then these two that are either very good at. Uh, 1PRW is interesting because it's the only problem where EO diff seek does much better than the MSA and structure based methods. And 3IXT is also interesting because uh, even if MSA does very poorly on it, despite you of seek and RF diffusion both doing okay on it. And we found that that one doesn't have very many homologs, which is why the MSA model struggles with it a bit. And finally, we're going to look at for um, the solved problems that even if MSA or even if seek solved, how diverse the scaffolds are from the natural scaffold. And in any almost every case where both even if MSA and even if seek have solutions to that, um, the even if MSA is going to be more conservative, which again makes sense because we're giving it implicit structural information. All right, so to summarize here, uh, we've trained a new set of EODIF models for controllable protein sequence generation. The idea is to start from natural sequences and we choose sequence over structure because uh, there's the scale is so much bigger and because it's the natural design space for proteins. Um, the eventual goal, sorry, and the eventual goal is to get uh, proteins that do new functions. Uh, we show some results for unconditional generation where we generate from scratch and come up with sequences that look realistic, plausible, and are diverse. We show motif scaffolding and IDR generation and other sorts of simple conditional generations. And in the future, we're looking at towards controllable generation where you can specify the desired function and get sequences that will hopefully do that function. Uh, with that, uh, I'd like to point you to the preprint as well as the code base. You can try these models. Uh, we are trying to be responsive on issues, but that's as responsive as we can. If we don't respond to GitHub, feel free to email us. And this work is done at, at, in the BioML group at MSR New England, which is just um, a great group of researchers and uh, research assistants and data scientists and managers at Microsoft. And with that, I can take questions. Hey, thank you. Uh, and Ram Davtian had a question. Do you want to read it up yourself or should I do it? This what is the advantage of evil diff MSA versus evil diff seek. So evil diff MSA lets you implicitly get a lot more information from hom homologs being generated, right? The disadvantage is it's going to be more computationally expensive and you have to find homologs. And in general, it tends to give you more conservative generations. Uh, Aram, do you have a question? So you want me um, to, to read the question? Yeah, so I guess I was yeah. curious. So when using the LRAR model, so in principle, mm -hmm. you can also do like conditional generation, if you actually um, generate, let's say, if you have like three regions, one before the fixed region, fixed region, and mm -hmm. the, whatever comes afterward, you can do a free generation in the first region, then mm -hmm. add the fixed sequence, and then mm -hmm. continue generation, uh, like just simply conditional on the previous two fragments. Mm -hmm. So that also seemed to be like one way to do it. So I was wondering, what do you think about that? Yeah, we actually show that based show that in the in the preprint. It doesn't do quite as well for the obvious reason. That, and I suspect that you could probably make it better by being careful about where you put the motif you want in the sequence. But yeah, it doesn't it tends not to do quite as well. 
I see. Thank you. Yeah, you're you're right. You could do that. Okay. I someone else has questions. Otherwise, I have a few questions. But if someone else just raise your hand or speak out, I. But okay, while well, well, while while you think about it, my I have I guess uh, well, obvious questions. You 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 when you say success rate here, that was for. Is that experimental tested or is it that basically refolding? It's like with the everything thing. here at us right now is in silico. We're working on experiments, but they take a little bit. So the uh, so is... when I say success yeah. rate, what I mean is um there's a PLDT cutoff, and then you want multi farm SD less than one. Thanks for okay. so, so, so that is like for me, I mean this slide here is actually one of the things uh so, I don't really understand what how it really can work because you have a functional motif that is not a linear in sequence. There are two parts of the protein mm -hmm. that sort of should interact. So how yes. do you how do you think the model really learns knows that these two should interact? So it's not, it's not like just design them to be far away from each other, or do you see them sometimes design things to be far away from each other? You also had one I mean, with like some beta sheets that do you, how how yeah. do you think it, what, what is that the reason to do that? Do you think? And insights. So, if you just give it the sequence, yeah, in general, it doesn't know if it should place those close together or not, right? Yeah. If you give it the MSA, it obviously knows. Yeah, yeah, it, sure. Yeah, if you give this, which is why I think in the sequence space. But you can, well, you can also think about though these sequence language printing language models as having, as kind of implicitly doing a MSA search. So it's not as yeah. good as doing have an explicit MSA, but it is looking, it is reasoning about all the sequences in Southern training and kind of yeah. the way you can think of it as an MSA. Okay, yeah. Uh, so basically you have attention, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. That makes sense. All right. And, and that, so, yeah. Go ahead. It's the same reason why ESM fold works for structure yeah, yeah, yeah. most of the time. Yeah. I mean, another question, I mean, you say always that you, you're, I mean, you, compared to like RF diffusion or anything you do with the uh, structure-based model, you have much more, you, I mean, Uniplot 50 is much bigger. So you can train right. much more data. But now in principle, I guess you could do a structure-based model trained on AlphaFold DB. You could. That's basically, that, that's basically the same size, more or less. Yeah, you the, think it would, the it, argument you think against it would... that yeah. is that you still actually have the same amount of structural data, right? Which is, the whatever our fold is trained on. Yeah. There's that there's not you maybe maybe the alpha fold predictions give you more information that's useful, but it's all based on those same two hundred thousand actual experimental structures. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, basically you see that the yeah, the prediction of the non structured region might be as crap, basically. It's like yeah. it might, might be as yes. yeah, 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 which is probably quite correct, yeah. Yes, that that's yeah. Uh Okay. Um, anyone else has any questions? You might. Just... If not, I mean, I think it's. Uh, I, mean, I guess have you tried the obvious thing to like? I want this geo term and I complete the sequence. Did you try? I mean, some experiments you tried. You had some parts that were not covered at all, but but yeah, I guess that's work ongoing. Or have you tried that at all? Sorry, say that again. I mean, you, I mean you, you, you had your GU prediction from Pro T5. So I guess you tried did you try the, the conditioning on, on a on a GU term? Does it work at all? Or is oh yeah. Uh, um we have not tried conditioning on on geo terms. We uh not in the lab at least. We've hmm. we're definitely working on very similar things, but it's not quite ready yet. Yeah. I mean I, I guess there are some problems with but it's that, that's I guess what people want. But I sort of yeah. would Assume that our problem was function is not that well defined, or well, some functions are, some functions are not. Yeah, fun function is weird because people mean different things by it, right? Sometimes you mean like it's an enzyme, or yeah, <laughs> sometimes yeah, yeah. you mean sure. it catalyzes this this in the formation of this in the antimer with high selectivity. <laughs> yeah, uh, so it means so certainly it's gonna be quite diffuse. So I, I would I, I right. would see that a model can get very confused and do something that's. I mean, the success rate I would doubt is extremely high, but that's that's my, mm -hmm. but uh, but it's just <laughs> guessing. It's like, yeah. okay, if there are no other questions, I guess we can thank Kevin again.
Yeah, thanks so much for having yeah, me. Thanks very much. And, and I'll just remind you that see you in a month and we'll have uh, a discussion. With, uh, if you have any questions or anything or like suggestions to discuss, send me an email or contact me in another way. Okay, great. Bye-bye. All right.